have tackled many strange stories on 60 Minutes, but perhaps none like this. It's the story of the U.S. government's grudging acknowledgement of unidentified aerial phenomena, UAP, more commonly known as UFOs. After decades of public denial, the Pentagon now admits there's something out there, and the U.S. Senate wants to know what it is. The Intelligence Committee has ordered the Director of National Intelligence and the Secretary of Defense to deliver a report on the mysterious sightings by next month. So what you're telling me is that UFOs, unidentified flying objects, are real. Bill, I think we're beyond that already. The government has already stated for the record that they're real. I'm not telling you that. The United States government is telling you that. Luis Elizondo spent 20 years running military intelligence operations worldwide in Afghanistan, the Middle East, and Guantanamo. He hadn't given UFOs a second thought until 2008. That's when he was asked to join something at the Pentagon called the Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program, or ATIP. The mission of ATIP was quite simple. It was to collect and analyze information involving anomalous uh, aerial vehicles, uh, what I guess in the vernacular you, you call them UFOs. We call them UAPs. You know how this sounds. It sounds nutty, wacky. Look, Bill, I, I'm, not, I'm not telling you that, that it doesn't sound wacky. What I'm telling you is real. The question is, what is it? What are its intentions? What are its capabilities? Buried away in the Pentagon, ATIP was part of a $22 million program sponsored by then-Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid to investigate UFOs. When Elizondo took over in 2010, he focused on the national security implications of unidentified aerial phenomena documented by U.S. service members. Imagine a technology that can do six to 700 G-forces, that can fly at 13,000 miles an hour, that uh, it can evade radar, and that can fly through air and water and possibly space. And oh, by the way, has no obvious signs of propulsion, no wings, no control surfaces, and yet still can defy the natural effects of Earth's gravity. That's precisely what we're seeing. Elizondo tells us ATIP was a loose-knit mix of scientists, electro-optical engineers, avionics and intelligence experts, often working part-time. They combed through data and records and analyzed videos like this. A Navy air crew struggles to lock on to a fast-moving object off the U.S. Atlantic coast in 2015. Recently released images may not convince UFO skeptics, but the Pentagon admits it doesn't know what in the world this is. Or this. Or this. So what do you say to the skeptics? It's refracted light, uh, weather balloons, a rocket being launched, v Venus. In some cases, there are, are simple explanations for what people are witnessing. But there are some that, that are not. We're not just simply jumping to a conclusion that's saying, oh, that's a UAP out there. We're going through our due diligence. Is it some sort of new type of cruise missile technology that China has developed? Is it some sort of high altitude balloon that's conducting reconnaissance? Ultimately, when you have exhausted all those what ifs and you're still left with, with the fact that this is in our airspace and it's real, that's when it becomes compelling and that's when it becomes problematic. Former Navy pilot, Lieutenant Ryan Graves, calls whatever is out there a security risk. He told us his F-18 squadron began seeing UAPs hovering over restricted airspace southeast of Virginia Beach in 2014 when they updated their jet's radar, making it possible to zero in with infrared targeting cameras. So you're seeing it both with the radar and with the infrared, and that tells you that there is something out there. Pretty hard to spoof that. These photographs were taken in 2019 in the same area, the Pentagon confirms these are images of objects it can't identify. Lieutenant Graves told us pilots training off the Atlantic coast see things like that all the time. Every day. Every day for at least a couple of years. Um, wait, wait a minute, every day for a couple of years? Mm -hmm. You know, I don't see an exhaust plume. Including this one, 
off the coast of Jacksonville, Florida in 2015, captured on a targeting camera by members of Graves' squadron. Well, there's a Look at that thing. It's rotating. Oh my gosh. They're all going against the wind. The wind's 120 knots to the west. Look at that thing, dude. You can sort of hear the surprise in their voices. You certainly can. They seem to have broke character a bit. Uh, and we're just kind of amazed at what they were seeing. What do you think when you see something like this? This is a difficult one to explain. You have rotation, you have high altitudes, you have propulsion, right? I don't know, I don't know what it is, frankly. He told us pilots speculate they are one of three things, secret U.S. technology, an adversary spy vehicle, or something otherworldly. I would say, you know, the highest probability is it's a threat observation program. Could it be Russian or Chinese technology? I don't see why not. Are you alarmed? I, I am worried, uh, frankly. You know, if these were tactical jets from another country that were hanging out up there, it would be a massive issue. But because it looks slightly different, we're not willing to actually look at the problem in the face. Uh, we're, we're happy to just ignore the fact that these are out there watching us every day. The government has ignored it, at least publicly, since closing its Project Blue Book investigation in 1969. But that began to change after an incident off Southern California in 2004, which was documented by radar, by camera, and four naval aviators. We spoke to two of them, David Fravor, a graduate of the Top Gun Naval Flight School and commander of the F-18 squadron on the USS Nimitz, and flying at his wing, Lieutenant Alex Dietrich, who has never spoken publicly about the encounter. I never wanted to be on national TV. <laughs> <laughs> no offense. So why are you doing this? Because I was in a government aircraft, because I was on the clock, and so I feel a responsibility to, to share what I can, and it is unclassified. It was November 2004, and the USS Nimitz Carrier Strike Group was training about 100 miles southwest of San Diego. For a week, the advanced new radar on a nearby ship, the USS Princeton, had detected what operators called multiple anomalous aerial vehicles over the horizon, descending 80,000 feet in less than a second. On November 14th, Fravor and Dietrich, each with a weapons system officer in the back seat, were diverted to investigate. They found an area of roiling white water the size of a 737 in an otherwise calm blue sea. So as we're looking at this, her backseater says, hey, Skipper, do you? And about that got out, I said, dude, do you, do you see that thing down there? And we saw this little white tic-tac looking object, and it's just kind of moving above the whitewater area. As so Dietrich circled above, Fravor went in for a closer there. look. So you're sort of spiraling down? Yep. The tic-tac's still pointing north-south. It goes and just turns abruptly and starts mirroring me. So as I'm coming down, it starts coming up. So it's, it's mimicking your moves. Yeah, it was aware we were there. He said it was about the size of his F-18, with no markings, no wings, no exhaust plumes. I want to see how close I can get. So I go like this, and it's climbing still. And when it gets right in front of me, it just disappears. Disappears? Disappears. Like gone. It had sped off. What are you thinking? So your, your mind tries to make sense of it. I'm going to categorize this as maybe a helicopter or maybe a drone. And when it disappeared, I mean, it was just. Did your backseaters see this too? Yeah. Oh yeah. There was four of us in the airplanes literally watching this thing for roughly about five minutes. Seconds later, the Princeton reacquired the target, 60 miles away. Another crew managed to briefly lock onto it with a targeting camera before it zipped off again. You know, I think that over beers, we've sort of said, hey man, if I saw this, solo. I don't know that I would have come back and said anything because it sounds so crazy when I say it. You understand that reaction? I do. I've had some people tell me, you know, when you say that you can sound crazy and when I'll be honest, I'm not a UFO guy. But from what I hear you guys saying, there's something. Yes. Oh, there's, there's definitely something that, I don't know who's building it, who's got the technology, who's got the brains, but there's, there's something out there that was better than our airplane. The air crew filed reports. Then, like the mysterious flying object, the Nimitz encounter disappeared. 
nothing was said or done officially for five years until Lou Elizondo came across the story and investigated. We spend millions of dollars in training these, these pilots and they are seeing something that they can't explain. Furthermore, that information is being backed up on electro-optical data, like gun camera footage, and by radar data. Now, to me, that's compelling. Inside the Pentagon, his findings were met with skepticism. ATIP's funding was eliminated in 2012, but Elizondo says he and a handful of others kept the mission alive, until finally, frustrated, he quit the Pentagon in 2017 but not before getting these three videos declassified. And then things took a stranger turn. I tried to help my colleague, Lou Elizondo, elevate the issue in the department and actually get it to the Secretary of Defense. Christopher Mellon served as Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Intelligence for Presidents Clinton and George W. Bush and had access to top secret government programs. So it's not us, that's one thing we know. We know that. I could say that with a very high degree of confidence, in part because of the positions I held in the department, and I know the process. Mellon says he grew concerned nothing was being done about UAPs, so he decided to do something. In 2017, as a private citizen, he surreptitiously acquired the three Navy videos Elizondo had declassified and leaked them to the New York Times. It's bizarre and unfortunate that Someone like myself has to do something like that to get a national security issue like this on the agenda. He joined forces with now civilian Lou Elizondo, and they started to tell their story to anybody who would listen, to newspapers, the History Channel, to members of Congress. We knew and understood that you had to go to the public, get the public interested to get Congress interested, to then circle back to the Defense Department and get them to start taking a look at it. And now it is. This past August, the Pentagon resurrected ATIP. It's now called the UAP Task Force. Service members now are encouraged to report strange encounters, and the Senate wants answers. Anything that enters an airspace that's not supposed to be there is a threat. After receiving classified briefings on UAPs, Senator Marco Rubio called for a detailed analysis. This past December, while he was still head of the Intelligence Committee, he asked the Director of National Intelligence and the Pentagon to present Congress an unclassified report by next month. This is a bizarre issue. The Pentagon and other branches of the military have a long history of sort of dismissing this. What makes you think that this time is going to be different? I mean, we're going to find out when we get that report. You know, there's a stigma on Capitol Hill. I mean, some of my colleagues are very interested in this topic and some kind of, you know, giggle. When you, when you bring it up. But I, I don't think we can allow the stigma to keep us from having an answer to a very fundamental question. What do you want us to do about this? I want us to take it seriously and have a process to take it seriously. I want us to have a process to analyze the data every time it comes in, that there be a place where this is cataloged and constantly analyzed until we get some answers. Maybe it has a very simple answer. Um, maybe it doesn't. We first told you about the tiny helicopter Ingenuity and the one-ton rover Perseverance nearly a year ago, before they left Earth. But they've come a very long way since then. In February, they landed in a hazardous and previously unexplored part of Mars called the Jezero Crater, where Perseverance will be looking for signs of ancient life. Last month, Ingenuity disconnected from Perseverance's belly and made history, performing the first flights ever in the atmosphere of another planet, it's hard to imagine, but worth remembering as you watch what we're about to show you that this all happened millions of miles away in outer space. Last month, in this desolate Martian crater, 170 million miles from Earth, Perseverance posed for a selfie with Ingenuity, the little helicopter it had just dropped off. Two weeks later, the rover's cameras recorded Ingenuity's historic first flight, hovering 10 feet off the ground for 30 seconds. It may not look like much, but for those who'd worked so long to make it happen, it was a reason to rejoice. Project manager Mimi Ong led the team at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in California that's been working on Ingenuity for six years. How hard is it to fly a helicopter on Mars? Very, very, very hard. <laughs> we really, uh, truly started with the question of 
Is it possible? A, a lot of people thought it, it could not be done. Because it's really counterintuitive. I mean, you need atmosphere the, for the blaze to push atmosphere to get lived. The atmosphere then, on Mars is completely and, different than the world. The atmosphere at Mars is so thin. I mean, the room we're in, right, it's compared to that, it was 1% of the atmospheric density over there. So the question of really, can you generate enough lift, you know, to really build, to lift up anything, that was the fundamental question. In subsequent flights, ingenuity has gone longer and farther traveling for about two minutes and nearly the length of three football fields. It is a triumph not only for NASA, but for its partners in the private yeah, sector who help make yeah. various parts of the helicopter. Don't let it go, don't freak out. Matt Keenan has a history of making <laughs> unusual things that can fly. And then I'm He's an engineer at a company called Aerovironment, which produces drones for military and civilian use. I mean, so, that's incredible. So Ten years ago, for a military research project, Keenan and his team created this robotic hummingbird, which has a tiny camera on board. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> there it is. Oh, my God, that's amazing. Keenan and engineer Ben Pippenberg led the aerovironment team that created Ingenuity's rotors, motors, and landing gear. Why was this so challenging? because it has to be a spacecraft as well as an aircraft. Um, and, and flying it as, a, as an aircraft on Mars is pretty challenging because of the density of the air that's similar to about Earth at 100,000 feet. How do you go about it? Well, so building everything extremely lightweight is uh, really, really critical. The helicopter's blades, for example, are made of a styrofoam-like material coated with carbon fiber. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> They're stiff and strong. Get a sense of how Oh my lightweight gosh. and stiff that is. I mean, it's nothing. Yeah, yeah, weighs nothing. But incredibly light. Here we go, taking off. This is the first time they've shown an outsider this version of Ingenuity, which they plan to use for education and research. They call it Terry. A lift off. <laughs> Here on Earth, Terry's blades are spinning at about 400 revolutions per minute. On Mars, in the thin atmosphere, they'd have to spin six times faster to generate the same lift. And then, and then land. Ingenuity costs $85 million to build and operate. Terry, a lot less, but it's still nerve-wracking to be handed its controls. All right, go ahead. You've got it. Slide it right. You can push it all the way to the right if you want. Slide left. Wow. I'll bring it up a little bit. Now stop. The joysticks we use to fly Terry are of no use on Mars. Radio signals take too long to get there. All right, let me take over now. I've okay. switched you out, and Whew. we'll go back to the... <laughs> Even someone as good at flying drones and hummingbirds as Matt Keenan couldn't fly a helicopter on Mars. Here's what happened in 2014 in a test chamber that replicated the atmosphere on Mars when Keenan tried to use a joystick to fly an early version of Ingenuity. Surprise! Wow. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, All right. So, so much for that vehicle. So this very quick demonstration is it showed you a human being can't respond quickly enough to control it. Exactly. So engineers at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory equipped Ingenuity with a computerized system that allows it to stabilize itself and navigate on its own. In 2016, the new system aced the chamber test. The blades are being commanded, you know, four or five hundred times per second. They proved it could fly, but Ingenuity still had to weigh under four pounds and fit in the belly of Perseverance. Five, Five. four, engine ignition, two, one. And it had to be tough enough to survive the journey to Mars. And liftoff. On July 30th, 2020, Perseverance and Ingenuity took off from Cape Canaveral. Nearly seven months later, as this simulation shows, the spacecraft's heat shield hit the Martian atmosphere, going 12,000 miles per hour. In Perseverance, ready to execute entry, descent, and landing on her own. As he sat in the control room, Al Chen, the leader of the landing team, had absolutely no control. Radio signals would take about 11 minutes to travel from Earth to Mars. The spacecraft was pre-programmed to descend, maneuver, and pick a landing site on its own. All the work his colleagues hoped to do on Mars would be impossible if his part of the mission failed. How long have you been working on this mission? Coming up on nine years or so. Really? That's a lot of work for seven minutes of if nine, nine years of work, seven minutes of terror. It's done if the parachute doesn't work. That's right. You know, no one wants to be that, uh, the guy that drops the baton. No landing by a spacecraft has ever been recorded as well as this one. 
There were six cameras capturing it all from different angles. The parachute deployed, then the heat shield fell away like a lens cap, and Perseverance got its first look at the ground. This is not a simulation. This is what it looks like to parachute onto Mars. How fast is it moving at this point? Yeah, we're still going about 350 miles an hour and still slowing down. So it looks gentle here, yeah. but in fact, you're, it's falling at more than 300 miles an hour. That's right. We're heading straight down at, uh, at near race car speeds. Below lay a series of safe landing spots, but the wind was blowing the spacecraft towards more treacherous territory to the east. And Perseverance sent a message to Earth saying the thrusters it needed to slow down might not be working properly. So you get a reading saying the, the jets that are going to help it right. slow down and control the landing, that they're not working. The so what do you do? Out. There's nothing you can do, right? Everything's already happened. That's the mind-bending part of this, right? You are sweating now. You yeah, exactly. I'm right it. back there again. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Altitude about 300 meters. To Alchen's relief, Perseverance's computerized landing system did what it was designed to do. It found a suitable landing spot even in rocky terrain. And despite the warning, the thrusters worked. You can see them kicking up dust as they fire to slow the spacecraft down. Sky crane maneuver has started. The descent stage, known as the sky crane, lowered Perseverance to the ground. It hovered for a moment, then flew off to crash a safe distance away. And there goes the descent wow. stage. Touchdown confirmed. Yeah. Perseverance safely on the surface of Mars. So at that point, big sigh of relief. Um, you know, I almost uh, collapsed over this console. Ever since Perseverance landed on the Red Planet, a team of engineers, programmers, and scientists here on Earth have been living on Mars time. It's their job to monitor the rover's health and tell it where to go and how to search for signs of life. While Perseverance sleeps to conserve energy during the freezing Martian nights, the team on Earth analyzes the photographs and instrument readings it sent back. They then prepare a list of things for it to do the following morning when it wakes up. And so it's just after midnight on Mars. The vehicle's asleep. Project manager Matt Wallace explained that a day on Mars is 40 minutes longer than on Earth. The team's schedule is constantly changing. So all the people here are, are Mars night shift workers. <laughs> yeah, that's a good way to think of it, yeah. But I mean, working night shift is tough enough, but this is a night shift that's constantly shifting. Constantly moving, yeah. that's right, yeah. On Perseverance's fourth day on Mars, it swiveled the powerful camera on its mast and took a look around. A space enthusiast named Sean Doran put the images together, set them to music, and posted the movie on YouTube. Even one of the top scientists on the project was moved when he saw it. You know, I went and got a beer and watched this thing scroll by. And, and that, mo that was the moment when I felt like I was there. Ken Farley leads the science team that will direct Perseverance through the Jezero Crater. It's an area that scientists have long wanted to search for signs of ancient life that may be hidden in the rocks. The oldest evidence of life on Earth is about three and a half billion years old. Those rocks were deposited in a shallow sea. This crater that you see here was a lake three and a half billion years ago. So we are looking at the same environment and the same time period on two different planets. And if it's determined, however long in the future, that no, there was not ever life, what does that mean? The place where Perseverance landed here in Jezero Crater uh, is the most habitable time period on Mars and the most habitable environment that we know about. This is, this is as good as it gets, at least with our current understanding of what Mars has to offer. And if we don't find life here, it does make us worry that perhaps it doesn't exist anywhere. Perseverance hasn't strayed far from its landing site yet, but its telescopic camera has already spotted a large number of boulders that Ken Farley says he didn't expect to see in the middle of an ancient lake. So this has surprised you? Absolutely, yeah. So what did those boulders tell you? The, the most reasonable interpretation is a flood. You don't have fast-flowing water out in the middle of the lake. You get fast-flowing water in a river. And so what that's telling us is there was a river that was capable of transporting boulders that were this big. So what, the lake would have gone down perhaps and then later on there was a flood? Yeah, exactly. Perseverance was supposed to leave Ingenuity behind after a 30-day demonstration of its flying ability. But NASA officials recently said they'll keep the duo together for another month to explore how rovers and helicopters might work together in the future. 
fastest that Perseverance was designed to travel is a tenth of a mile per hour. Ingenuity has already gone 80 times faster, according to project manager Mimi Ong. Adding an aerial vehicle, a flying vehicle for space exploration will be game changing. It frees you in a way. Absolutely, yes. So a flying vehicle, a rotorcraft would allow us to get to places we simply can't access today, like sites of steep cliffs, you know, inside deep crevices. After Perseverance explores the floor of Jezero Crater, it'll head towards what's believed to be the remnant of an ancient river delta, where billions of years ago, conditions should have been right for microorganisms to exist. As this simulation shows, the rover's robotic arm can collect about 40 core samples of rock that'll be sealed in special tubes and left on the planet's surface. NASA plans to send another mission to Mars to retrieve the tubes and bring them back to Earth. In about 10 years, Ken Farley says, scientists examining those samples may be confronted with a new and perplexing question. How do you look for life that may not be life as you know it? We've never had to do that before. We've never had to actually ask the question. Is there a form of life that we can't even conceive of? Yeah, we're going to have to conceive of it. I think to, that's the whole point of this. We're going to have to start conceiving of life as we don't know it. If all goes according to plan, Perseverance will be making tracks on Mars for years to come. Since it's carrying the first working audio microphones on the red planet, we'll leave you with what it sounds like as the one-ton rover slowly moves across the vast, lonely expanses of Mars. This December 22nd may become known as the day the universe changed. That Wednesday, NASA expects to launch the James Webb Space Telescope, the largest and most expensive instrument ever flown. 100 times more powerful than the 31-year-old Hubble telescope, Webb can see back in time all the way to the let there be light moment, that instant when a cold, dark universe ignited into stars. Wow. <laughs> Well, somehow that's a lot bigger than I imagined. She's a big one. A year ago, we were among the last humans to see the telescope, much as it will appear in space. After our visit, it was packed away for a journey of a million miles, far beyond the moon, to lie forever in the grasp of the sun. The operating life is how long? Uh, it's designed for five and a half years with a goal of 10 years. So. That means we carry enough uh, stuff on there uh, to last for 10 years. Amy Lowe is a systems engineer who took us up in the clean room at Northrop Grumman in Redondo Beach, California. We had to invent it, design it, build it, and hand put it together. At the bottom of the spacecraft, that silver shroud is a parasol, big as a tennis court, to shield Webb from the sun. Above, there are 21 feet of gold-plated mirrors, six times bigger than Hubble's mirror, to catch the earliest starlight in creation. There are 18 of these hexagonal mirrors, but when you fold them out, they all work in concert as one mirror. That's right. All 18 images will form one very nice, solid image. That image would be invisible to the human eye. Like a night vision camera, Webb is designed to see heat, infrared light, because that's the only signature left from the stars at the edge of time. Even that glow will be so dim, the mirrors will have to squint for hours to expose an image. How much confidence do you have? Um, you know, <laughs> uh, my job is to worry. I personally feel confident that uh, we have thought of uh, everything. Thinking of everything took more than 25 years and $10 billion. Engineer Amy Lowe explained the challenge. In my mind, the biggest engineering challenge was to build a sun shield capable of shielding the optics, the mirrors, and the instrument on web. How do you build something big but lightweight? The sun shield keeps web cold and dark 
any infrared heat from the sun or earth would blind the telescope. The five layers are made of gossamer sheets not unlike mylar birthday balloons. The layer facing the sun is layer one, and layer one reaches about 230 degrees Fahrenheit, so uh, a, a pretty warm oven, like if you wanted to cook a meringue or something. And on the, on the telescope side? On the telescope side, it gets to negative 370 degrees Fahrenheit. There's a roughly 600 degree difference. There is. Between one side of the heat shield and the other. Yes, it's amazing that it's able to do this with nothing more than these layers. The engineering is amazing, but the science may reveal the universe. Since the beginning, the Big Bang, the arrow of time has flown nearly 14 billion years. Webb may see all the way back to the first 100 million, the baby universe. Powerful telescopes. Like Amber Strawn is an astrophysicist yeah, yeah. on the project. Telescopes really are time machines. They literally allow us to see into the past. And the reason for that is just due to the nature of how light travels. Light from the sun takes about eight minutes to get to the Earth. So we're seeing the sun as it was eight minutes ago. And you can sort of think about stepping that further out into the universe. So when we walk out under the stars and look above us, we're not seeing the stars as they are today. We're seeing them as they were perhaps millions of years ago. Absolutely. Because it took that long for the light to reach the Earth. Yes, for sure. How much do we know about the universe? Everything we know about, everything we can see, me and you, everything on the planet, all the hundreds of billions of other galaxies, all of that only makes up about 5% of the universe. The rest of it, that other 95%, we have no idea what it is. That 95%, the unknown, is all around us like a ghost. Nearly all the cosmos is made up of what physicists call, in desperation, dark matter and dark energy. Never seen, scientists infer they must exist because they're the best explanation for how galaxies form and move. So we know that dark matter is sort of the scaffolding of the universe. It's the, the structure on which galaxies sit. Uh, and if there wasn't dark matter, there wouldn't be galaxies and there wouldn't be us. What might the Webb telescope reveal about dark matter? It's like we have this 14 billion year old story of the universe, but we're missing that first chapter. And Webb was specifically designed to allow us to see those very first galaxies that formed after the Big Bang. Now, galaxies are born and then they evolve, they change over time. And this way that galaxies change must rely critically on dark matter. And Webb is going to allow us to observe that process of galaxy evolution in much more detail. The promise of discovery shielded Webb on what's already been a treacherous journey. It was to launch seven years ago, but delays come with a machine this ambitious. Because of cost overruns, Webb was canceled in 2011 by the House Appropriations Committee, but it was saved in the Senate. Its namesake is James Webb, head of NASA in the 1960s, who made science a top priority. What are the stakes? What's riding on that rocket with Webb? When you talk about what's at stake, it really is NASA's reputation to take on a mission that is as challenging as Webb and be successful. Bill Oakes and Greg Robinson run the program. Oakes was an engineer on Hubble. Robinson has supervised NASA quality and performance. If you want to be bold and get the kind of science we're after, uh, you have to make the investment. And, and it's gonna answer two big questions for astrophysics. Where did we come from and are we alone? And we're looking forward to getting those results. Is Webb gonna work? Uh, yes, it's going to work. I have very high confidence. I am 100% confident. Why 100% confident? Because when I look at the testing that we have done over the years and the type of engineering that went into it, you build a sense of confidence that you know it's going to work. What are you most concerned about? Unfolding the entire telescope is what you worry about. The observatory had to be folded into an Ariane 5 rocket just 16 feet wide. It's wrapped today tight as a rosebud. In flight, more than 40 systems must blossom with perfection 
including Amy Lowe's never invented before sunshield. All five layers will be folded up and held in place by pens. How many pens are there? There's 107 of these uh, membrane release devices and pins that hold all five layers pinned to this structure here called a UPS, all total 107. And as you're unfolding, how many of those can fail? None. None? None. Not one? Not one. There is literally no room for error. We uh, test and we do a lot of analysis to ensure that each and every single one of these will release on orbit. $10 billion rides on those pens. The Hubble telescope, 340 miles up, could be reached with a wrench. Webb, at a million miles, is beyond repair. Bill Oakes told us that if something does get stuck, there is an emergency plan. We've developed algorithms to essentially, maybe we call it the shimmy, we do a little shake on the telescope and we can rock it back and forth. If that doesn't work, we have another one we call the twirl, which can actually spin the telescope either clockwise or counterclockwise to help shake things loose. So you're going to do what I do with devices when they're not working, you're going to shake it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, can I do the same thing? Yes. <laughs> yeah. If 107 pins release, the mirrors synchronize, and 10,000 things go right, Webb will be limited only by about 10 years of fuel for pivoting and pointing. Canada contributed the aiming system that will guide Webb to wonders far and near. More than a thousand astronomers around the world are competing for telescope time. Heidi Hamill was granted 100 hours. I have so many questions. Um, my particular focus is objects in our solar system. Hamill told us that light is full of information. Webb can define the chemistry of a place by analyzing its wavelengths of light. What is the atmospheric water content of Mars? And how does it change with time? What drives the chemistry in the upper atmosphere of Neptune? Can we see if there's water coming out of the moons of Jupiter or Saturn? There are just uh, an infinite number of questions I want to answer. Astrophysicist Natalie Battaglia also has time on Webb. She'll be looking at planets beyond our solar system. On average, every star in the galaxy has at least one planet. That means that there are more planets in the galaxy than there are stars, hundreds of billions of planets. And with that many planets, Battaglia is sure Webb could find some with the chemistry and conditions of life. There happens to be one planetary system. The star has seven planets orbiting it, and the star is only about 40 light years away. So it's a great target to study, and it has three Earth-sized planets orbiting in what I would call the Goldilocks zone, where life could potentially exist. Not too hot, not too cold. That's the idea, yes. And so this is also one of the very first targets that we're going to observe, observe with Webb. And what we'll be able to, to see is, is there carbon dioxide in the atmosphere? What are the greenhouse gases? Is there carbon dioxide in combination with methane? Because that's what Earth has. So by looking at these chemical constituents, we might be able to piece together if it's not just a planet in what we call the habitable zone, but if it's truly a habitable environment. And somebody might ask, why does it matter? The end point is to put an end to our cosmic loneliness. We want to know if there's life out there. From a researcher's perspective, is Webb evolutionary or revolutionary? Every time you put a new piece of technology into space or you look at the universe with different eyes, you, you learn something revolutionary, something that you couldn't have even predicted. I don't know what those surprises are going to be, but the technology is revolutionary and there will be tremendous surprises that will astound us. Webb is on the doorstep aboard a European Space Agency rocket. Some, including Amy Lowe, may hold their breath as it unfolds itself on the month-long journey to its station around the sun. The first images, in six months or so, will be converted from invisible infrared into pictures suitable for headlines. 
chances are what we see we will not understand. The very definition of wonder. NASA's James Webb Space Telescope has hardly opened its eyes, and the universe is new, more mysterious, more beautiful than humanity's dreams. The largest telescope ever flown launched into deep space on Christmas Day 2021. Its primary mission is to reveal the let there be light moment when the stars and galaxies first ignited after the Big Bang. Recently, we got a look at some captivating images as Webb peers back toward the origin of everything. This is one of Webb's early deep dives into the cosmos, 250 hours of exposures that expand the imagination. And all these little dots are stars? All these little dots are galaxies, uh, some of which are bigger than our own. Astrophysicist Brent Robertson flew us through 130,000 galaxies, half never seen before, enormous swirls of billions of stars each, some like our own Milky Way, and others, well, out of this world. We call this galaxy at the center of the screen the cosmic rose. <laughs> Just by chance, it looks like a rose does. Um, you can see that dusty, red, irregular galaxy. You know, space is more crowded than you might think, and actually galaxies wind up interacting with each other. They actually will merge together. So I'm zooming in now on a pair of galaxies that are merging together, interacting. You can see that they're disturbed because the gravity of one galaxy yanks the stars out of the other galaxy. They're running into each they're other. They're running into each other. Robertson of the University of California, Santa Cruz, helps lead Webb's most ambitious mission, the Advanced Deep Extragalactic Survey. Well, we've discovered the most distant galaxy in the universe, the one that is the furthest away from us that we currently know about. Uh, I'd like to share that with you. Can I show you Please, some pictures? I'd of love it? to see it. So as we zoom in, we keep going, we keep going. And now this red splotch that you see there, that galaxy, that's a galaxy, that galaxy is more than 33 billion light years away. How long after the Big Bang, the beginning of the universe, did this galaxy form? It's amazing. It's only 320 million years after the Big Bang. The most distant galaxy so far, there on the right, doesn't look like much, but astronomers can fill textbooks by analyzing the spectrum of its light. So we can actually measure things like how fast it's forming stars. We can measure the amount of stars in the galaxy. We know the size because we know how far away it is. Uh, and we know the typical age of the stars in the galaxy. So we know a lot. The earliest galaxy so far formed when the universe was 2% of its current age. And the baby galaxy ignited stars at a furious pace. It's like a hummingbird. You know, the heartbeat of this galaxy is so rapid. What do you mean by that? Well, this galaxy is forming stars at about the rate of the Milky Way, even though it's 100 times less massive. So it really is like a hummingbird. The heartbeat of this galaxy is racing. T minus 30 seconds and counting. More than a few human hearts were racing in 2021 Standing as the $10 the billion dollar observatory readied for launch. Wow. <laughs> Earlier that year, we were among the last to see Webb in California before it was folded into a 15-foot wide nose cone. Well, somehow that's a lot bigger than I imagined. 25 years in the making, Webb is named for an early NASA administrator. Northrop Grumman engineer Amy Lowe showed us down below the silver-colored sunshield big as a tennis court, and 21 feet of gold-plated mirrors for gathering light. There are 18 of these hexagonal mirrors, but when you fold them out, they all work in concert as one mirror. That's right. All 18 images will form one very nice, solid image. And lift off. 
decollage liftoff from a tropical rainforest to the edge of time itself, James Webb begins a voyage back to the birth of the universe. Webb lofted on a European rocket into an orbit around the sun a million miles away. To set up for observations, engineers used a star to align those mirrors. But the image was speckled with what looked like artifacts of digital noise, which forced a closer look. These were not artifacts from the detector. These were not strange stars. The whole of the sky was filled with galaxies. There was no empty sky. And that's when I went, this telescope's going to be phenomenal. Matt Mountain leads Webb's operations as president of the Association of Universities for Research in Astronomy. No empty sky. What do you mean by that? And almost every image we're taking now, we see galaxies everywhere. I mean, we took a simple picture of a planet in our own system, Neptune. You know, it was a, this beautiful orb just sitting there, and we saw some rings. And the background, a galaxies again. It tells us that the universe is filled with galaxies. We knew this theoretically. But when you go out to the night sky, we're used to saying, well, look up the night sky, we see those stars. We can no longer say that. We now have to say, look up the night sky, and there are galaxies everywhere. We call it space because we thought there was nothing out there. There is no empty sky with James Webb. That is what we have discovered. Matt Mountain says that Webb is a reminder of how much we do not know. For example, galaxies are rushing away from each other at greater and greater speed, defying gravity. It makes no sense. So scientists infer that there must be unseen elements at work. They call them dark energy and dark matter. And whenever you hear the term dark energy or dark matter, this means we don't know what it is. We're not that imaginative. But it is a force. It is 95% of our universe. And we have no idea what it is. Wait a minute. 95% of our universe is made up of dark energy and dark matter, and we don't know what it is. Correct. We're lucky if we even understand 4% of our universe today. Astronomy is a very humbling discipline. <laughs> Humbling, but with Webb. Look at this. Also thrilling. Look at this. Right. This is Purdue University astronomer Dan Milisavlovich, starstruck and chatting with a colleague. Yes. Yes. Look at the look at the detail. Even Wilbur, who's not an astronomer, strained to see what the excitement was about. Mili Savlovich studies exploded stars, which were the furnaces that forged the first heavy elements from a cosmos of simple helium and hydrogen. Every time there's a supernova explosion, it's producing the raw materials for life. The iron in our blood, the calcium in our bones, the oxygen that we breathe, <sighs> love that oxygen. All that is being manufactured in supernova explosions. The late astronomer Carl Sagan used to say we're all made of star stuff. That's exactly right. Webb reveals unprecedented detail at the center of these explosions. And that's what Webb is most sensitive to for our purposes. Understanding what's happening inside the explosion that we couldn't see before because it only comes out in infrared light. Infrared light is what Webb is designed to see. Like a night vision camera, the telescope is sensitive to heat radiation, which is all that remains of the light reaching us from the dawn of time. Trouble is, infrared is invisible to the human eye. When you first pull up the Webb data, what does that look like? Essentially, it looks like a blank screen. <laughs> Elisa Pagan, and Joe DePasquale are astronomers and science imagers for the Space Telescope Science Institute. This is what a web infrared picture looks like until they match the data-filled darkness to colors of wonder. So we take those longest wavelengths of infrared light and give those the red colors. The next uh, shortest wavelengths would be green, and then the shortest wavelengths that we get from web are colored blue. 
And so just like how our eyes work, we take those three color channels, com combine them together to create the full color images that we see from Webb. Among their favorite images is this cluster of stars with the not so wondrous name NGC 346. Cosmic dust sculpted into ripples by interactions between stars. And the Tarantula Nebula, a star birthing nursery on a backdrop of galaxies. It occurs to me you're the first two people to see these images in human history. Yeah. It's, it's quite an honor. It is a great <laughs> honor, and it does blow your mind every time. There will be many mind-blowing revelations. Webb is already the first to find carbon dioxide in the sky of a planet 700 light years away. It will continue to look for planets with atmospheres that might support life. On the other end of the time scale, astrophysicist Erica Nelson of the University of Colorado Boulder thinks her team may have made a discovery that she says would break the theory of how the early universe formed. Either this is wrong or this is a huge discovery. And we think that it's a huge discovery. So. More observations are needed, but Nelson is investigating what may be five giant galaxies that appear to have formed much too quickly after the Big Bang. If they're confirmed, astronomy may have to revise the timeline of galaxy formation. And that's the most exciting piece of this, of this telescope, of this remarkable instrument we put in space, is finding things that we didn't expect, that we can't explain, because that means that we have to revise our understanding of the universe. Well, we have Brant Robertson, who showed us the earliest galaxy found so far by the James Webb Telescope, told us the record for the earliest will not hold long. How far back can you go to the origins of the universe? Well, JWST is so phenomenal that if you spend enough time, you could probably find any galaxy that ever formed uh, in the universe. It's really that powerful. Will the history of astronomy be divided between before Webb and after Webb? Yes, I believe it will be. Matt Mountain, who manages Webb operations, told us the observatory may last up to 25 years, perhaps long enough to comprehend space and time and the origins of life. We're seeing a universe we've never seen before. We thought it was there, we hoped it was there, but now we see it for the first time.